Well, good evening. Grab your Bible. Turn to Matthew chapter number 2. Matthew chapter number 2. Account and honor. Thank you, Pastor, for the privilege to preach to the coveted Sunday night crowd. If I've heard it a hundred times, uh, if not more, uh, how much Pastor loves the Sunday night service. And to be able to preach that, we count it an honor. We count it a privilege to stand in the pulpit. I hope you understand the spirit in which I say this. It's not so much this piece of wood when people talk about the great honor it is to preach at the Cleveland Baptist Church. I understand fully who has stood behind this pulpit, and I think in every, uh, both our founding pastor, our pastor emeritus, they would agree it's not this chunk of wood in front of you, it's the congregation we're preaching to. Amen. And church, you're a special church. You sure mean a lot to us, and we count it a privilege to open God's Word and uh, get some help, get some encouragement, I think. In Matthew chapter number 2, we'll begin reading in verse number 13. Go ahead and stand with us. We'll read this uh, passage together, have a word of prayer, and then you could be seated. And Matthew chapter number 2, and verse number 13. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream. I have to under- think about this as we're sitting there and looking over this again, that uh, the Holy Spirit is catching Matthew's attention, and, and thus catching ours. You see that, behold? He could have just said, and when they were departed, the angel of the Lord. But he didn't say that. He says, behold. Like, get your attention. This is not Joseph's doing. This is the God of heaven orchestrating some things. This is God of heaven directing some things to take place for a reason. Uh, it appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night, and departed into Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod, when he, had, uh, when he had saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth, and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah, was their voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he had heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither. Notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. With God's help tonight, I'd like to preach a message of just simply titled, uh, Be Thou There. It comes out of our, our text in verse number 13. Uh, where the angel says in the dream here to Joseph, flee into Egypt and be thou there until I bring the word. Let's pray. Our Father, we love you, Lord. We lift up your name today. Lord, if we pause for a moment and think where we'd be without you, without your love and your mercy and your grace. Lord, it's a scary thought. We're thankful, God, that you loved us. We thank you, Lord, that you've saved us. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house tonight, to open your word, Lord, to be encouraged and be challenged with some, just some simple thoughts from the, the example that we find here in Joseph in the Christmas story, and even beyond that, in the early days of Jesus' life. Father, I pray that you'd uh, settle my heart, and I pray, God, that you'd help us to convey the, the thoughts and uh, the burden you put on my heart, Lord, in a way that's pleasing to you, that's encouraging to our church family. We love you. Thank you so much for what you're doing. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. 2020 certainly has been a trying year. Uh, It's been a trying year for many people in many different ways. When I uh, think about this, how this year started out, we had a chance last last Christmas season to preach, and I shared a testimony of my Uncle Mike, how that uh, he had lived a drunkard's life, uh, the majority of his adult life, and now he's in his uh, late 60s, and his life had been ruined by alcohol, and my dad just had a, a great burden for him. And I shared with you that my, my intention was to go see him over the Christmas holiday, over the New Year's. And we made plans to go visit my, Sherry, my, my sister, Sherry. And um, we, had chan- we had plans to go see him. We had the whole three days planned out. And it just so happened, you know, one thing after another, uh, things just weren't working out. And we weren't going to be able to see him. 
And finally, on New Year's Day, I told my wife, I said, I have to go. I have to. We've come this close. We have to get there. And I think the Lord just worked it out and had an opportunity to spend about two hours with him in the hospital, about an hour and a half, two hours in the hospital. I had every intention of bringing lots of literature. I had booklets. I had pamphlets. I had tracts galore. And uh, I was going to leave them with him. I, I expected him to, to say, no, Tommy, I'm not interested. You know, I've, I've told your dad numerous times, me and God are okay. I expected him to shut me down. And God gave us an opportunity to spend, again, a couple hours there with him. And I got to, I got to uh, listen to him pray and trust Christ as his Savior. Amen. So as much as I don't like what's happened in 2020, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I wouldn't trade it for anything. We didn't know that um, he would die 12 days later. We knew that alcohol destroyed uh, much of his body. And as far as we knew, we didn't have any type of diagnosis, no disease, nothing like that. But he just destroyed his body so much, he never recuperated. I'm so thankful for January 1st of 2020. And uh, we look over this year. We've, we've had some heartache this year. We've had some troubles. And our, I know I understand our year's not done, and we don't know what lies ahead. But I, but I have to think about this. I, I have to think that even in school, when we go to school, if we, if we don't learn a subject, they make you repeat it. And in college, you get the privilege of paying to repeat it, right? Uh, you have to repeat it. And, boy, I just, I wonder what God's teaching us in 2020. I've, I've spent some time thinking what God's teaching me in 2020. And I just wonder tonight what he's trying to teach us. Some things that he's trying to teach us. I believe we can see some lessons in the life of Joseph in our passage. And with this phrase, be thou there, we get this out of verse number 13. Where the angel says, be thou there. It gives the idea that it's, a, it's, it's present tense, but it's almost like it's ongoing. Be thou there. Joseph, I want you to be thou there. He's not given any other, any other instructions. He's not told what to do while he's there. He's not to, told exactly where to go. No, again, we're, we're not given all the information. Maybe, maybe there's more. But I, I figured if God didn't give it to us, then what he's given to us is enough. He just says, be thou there. And if you and I, are, we think about this, we have a lot of similarities than, than what Joseph is going through back in his day. It's certainly a time of uncertainty. A lot of things unknown. Can you imagine the life of that young man? Hearing that news that your spouse's wife is going to have a child, and it's not yours. It's, it's definitely not yours. You know it's not yours. Matter of fact, it's from the Holy Ghost. And, and these, these thoughts begin to run through your mind. You, you think about it in, in Joseph's day. Everything's different now. I don't know what kind of plans he had. I don't know what his, what his intentions were after him and Mary got married. But everything changes now. It does. They, they cannot travel the same. I mean, come on. <laughs> you remember the first time you had a child. Now, now you're, you're late everywhere you go. And then you add two. And then you're late five, ten minutes everywhere you go. And then they're off from, coming home from college. And they're still making you late no matter what's going on. Uh, th everything changes when children are involved. And I, I think in our life, I, I know we've heard this, I just want things to be normal. I'm thankful that when we come here, it does feel normal. I, I'm, I'm rejoicing in that, I really am. We look out in our world, it's, it's good to have a place where we can come together. And I don't know, I don't know if we'll ever have normal again. And no doubt in Joseph's day, there's political unrest. We can relate to that. As I was thinking about this and thinking about all the things that are going on, I began to think about some of the third world countries and how this is just a normal thing for them. The political unrest, dealing with mass uh, sickness and illnesses. When I think about it in, in Joseph and when I look at the life of Joseph, I just I simplify it in this way. I, I believe he loves God. We'll talk about that in a second. He loves his family and he just wants to do right. I think we can just say amen and go home. Love God. Love your family and just do right. Just be right with the Lord. I think there's some things that we can look at here. Uh, first lesson we find here is a lesson of faith. We have to go, kind of go before our text. Look back at Matthew chapter number 1 and look at verse number 18 as we consider the lesson of faith. The Bible says in verse number 18, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then, jo then her, uh, Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. The Bible says here that he was a just man. 
This means right, it means righteous. It means upright, it refers to God's proper standards of actions expressed in the covenants. A just man would be a person who is in accordance with God's standards. One that is in a proper relationship with God. Well, what is it that we learn from a just man? What, what, what is it that, that a just man does? Uh, hold your spot there, Matthew. Turn just a couple pages. Look at Malachi chapter number 2. I inadvertently came across this passage. I think my eyes were a little blurry, and I thought I was in Matthew chapter 2, and I stumbled upon Malachi chapter 2. And uh, I looked at this verse, and I, and I just wonder if maybe this is what is going through the mind of a just man. Of a young man who's, 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 the lady that he's espoused to is with child of the Holy Ghost. Look in Malachi chapter number 2 in verse number 14. Malachi is get, uh, pronouncing the judgment of God in verse number 14. He says, yet you say, wherefore? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the... Uh, uh, residue of the spirit, and whereof one, that he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith he that he hateth, uh, that he hateth putting away. For one cover the violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take ye heed to your spirit, that ye deal not treacherously. I wonder if maybe that's what Joseph is considering. He's, he's remembering the words of the prophet Malachi. We understand there's been a time of silence for some time. No doubt, as a just man, he would have known Scripture. He would have read this passage. I wonder if he's, he, if he's thinking about this as he's considering putting her away. We think about this, and we look at verse number 20, back in Matthew chapter number 1. It says, but while he thought on these things. What? What things? Putting her away. And how is this going to be? Is, 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 Lord, is this a matter of my heart? Is this my pride? What, 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 Lord, what, what's going on here? And while he's thinking about these things, we're talking about a lesson in faith. Behold, verse number 20, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Can I remind you tonight that faith conquers fear? We don't have to wait to hear from an angel tonight. Our pastor uh, 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 touched on this verse uh, uh, this morning. We have something today that's better than the words of an angel, something more sure. We find this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21, verse number 19. It says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy. And we think about the context of that passage. Uh, Peter is actually revealing the eyewitness account on the Mount of Transfiguration and hearing the voice of God the Father from heaven. And yet he makes this, declar this declarative statement in the passage that he's not following cunning devised fables or uh, some private or secret ancient text that's only uh, for their interpretation. No, he says, we have the very words of God from the Holy Ghost, from holy men of God. We have a more sure word of prophecy. So if we're sitting here tonight and say, oh yeah, I'll be a person of faith if an angel comes to me. I'm telling you based upon the authority of scripture, that's not the case at all. Because we, we have a more sure word. Why is this important? It's important because Romans 10, 17 says, so that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Uh, hold your spot there, Matthew. Turn to Hebrews chapter number 11. In Hebrews chapter number 11, you heard the verse again this morning. And we look at the context of this, but without faith, this great hall of faith chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not uh, seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went out, not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him for the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundation, whose builder and maker is God. We're talking about a lesson in faith. No doubt, no doubt Joseph would have heard, uh, Joseph would have known about these men and their account of faith. Just as God guided these men, he longs to guide you and I here tonight. 
There's a God in heaven who is still interested in the affairs of mankind. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was at all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Not only do we find a God that's interested in the affairs of man, we find the God who is intentionally fulfilling prophecy. Three times in our passage, we read, three times in our passage, prophecy is being fulfilled. So here's our first question tonight. Well, how about our faith in 2020? Can it be said of us that we are people of faith? Can it be said of you and I tonight that we are just people, we are righteous, upright people? Uh, people in accordance with God's standards, a people that have a desire to be in a proper relationship with God. As we sit here tonight, I recognize fully that your be thou there is different than my be thou there. God had a plan for Joseph just as much as he had a plan for Mary, just as much as he had a plan for the wise men, just as much as he had a plan for the shepherds. But my, my question is, where, is, what is your be thou there? You're there, is, is, it refers to, the, it, it could be a place, a physical place, a locality. For some of you, it's your place in your pew. Be thou there. Oh, what an encouragement it is to see a church with people in it. It thrills our hearts to stand every, day, every service, to, to fellowship and to, and to lead a service with you. Uh, it, it, it's your, your, your be thou there is your, it's your place of, of ministry, your place of service. It's work in the nursery. It's ride, driving a bus. It's, it's making bus calls on, on Saturday mornings. That, that's your, your, your there. But it also, it also refers to an attitude of the heart. It's a contentment. I'm, I'm just saying, I, I look in Joseph's life, and I have to wonder, as, as a man would do, he would begin to wonder, how is this all going to work? How is this all going to unfold? What's, what's going to happen from here? After, after the, uh, the angels leave, uh, the, uh, after the, the dreams, after the, uh, uh, the, the, the shepherds leave, if we, if, if, tonight, if we're going to answer our call to our be thou there, we're going to need to be a people of faith. Yeah. We are. We need people of Kate, uh, faith. Lesson number two, we're going to have to be people of courage. Look back at Matthew chapter 2 and verse number 13. When they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. That word arise, it just simply means to awake. It can even mean awake from sleep. That's what, I think that's what we find here. It means to raise up. It means to stir up. The same word that's used here is used when Jesus uh, told Peter and John and James to, to wake up in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's the same word that, that Jesus used to describe his resurrection. He said, I'll rise again. And as other accounts, we're talking about the resurrection three days after Christ's crucifixion. It's the same word that the Apostle Paul uses in Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 14 through 16. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest. And arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the ties, the time, because the days are evil. As I was reading this passage and thinking about this, I got encouraged by this truth, the fact that God does not ask us to do what he will not enable us to do. Many times, he'll ask us to do things that we cannot physically do in our own strength. I'm just, I'm just being very transparent with you tonight. Sometimes it's easier when it's in our own strength. Isn't it? Because we can do it. And we know we can do it. And we have that confidence in it. But it's trusting the Lord and His strength. And we think about this and, and this idea of courage. Uh, back in our text here, he says here that they were to, to flee into Egypt. And, and I, I would submit to you that sometimes it takes courage to run. Uh, in reading a, a commentary, Matthew Henry commentary, he, he brought out this point. I'd never thought about it before. He says, uh, think about all the, the, the miracles around Christ's birth. And yet we don't get a miracle in, in their fleeing to Egypt. We don't get a miracle that saves them from Herod, from the, this, this threat. 
We don't find, we don't have an account of them coming to, to the Lord and, 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 and uh, talking to God and asking God to do something, something miraculous. If, if this is Christ and the Messiah, then, then you know, in, in some miraculous way, uh, spare us. In some miraculous way, uh, do something to save us from this, uh, this pending danger. And this thought came to me. Sometimes in the Christian life, many times in the Christian life, it's more practically lived than it is miraculously lived. It is. We, we get the accounts of Scripture, and we get to hear the lives of individuals. But do you understand the stories that we get to hear make up just a fraction of their life? There's so much more beyond the miraculous days. There's so much more in the practical days. It took courage for Joseph not to put Mary away. It took courage to pack up your family. Listen, listen to the, the tone in verse number 13. I just want you to think of yourself as a man. This is, this is your, uh, your wife, and now she's going to be having this child from, from uh, the Holy Spirit. Listen to the text, to the tone in verse number 13. Arise, take the young child, clearly not his, he knows that, and his mother. He didn't say your wife. He didn't say Mary. Now everything. Now you, we'll find, we, we, we don't find a whole lot about Joseph beyond these first couple chapters. We don't find a whole lot about him after the fact. We're not, the Bible doesn't, isn't clear on what happened with him. But clearly, he's, he's taken somewhat of a back seat here. This is not, this is not for him to, to build up himself. And we think about it, it, it took courage. It took courage for him to pack up his family and, and flee to Egypt. Of all places, why Egypt? Why Egypt? I mean, we've, we've heard it for years, going down to Egypt. That's a picture of the world. That's where the Hebrews were, were getting out of. Why would God send him back? It just didn't make it a whole lot of sense. But when I think about it, and we understand this, and Scripture even, even tells us here, to fulfill Scripture, verse number 15. Uh, that which was spoken of by the Lord, of the Lord, by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. So the question tonight, the other question we have is, what is it that God's calling you to arise and do? He said to Joseph, arise and take the family, take, take the, uh, the child and his mother. And we find again in another passage, arise and go. Well, what is it that God's calling us to do tonight? Is there something specific? Uh, in in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, Peter writes, Yea, I think it meet as long as I'm, as I'm in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Remember that word arise, one of the definitions was to stir him up. He says here, go back in verse 13. He says, uh, and be thou there until I bring thee word. And I'm reminded, I'm reminded, uh, t turn to Psalm 105. This is not uh, the first time that a Hebrew named Joseph was in Egypt in a precarious situation. Look at Psalm 105 with me, please. We're talking about lessons, a lesson of faith and a lesson of courage. Psalm 105, look with me in verse number uh, 16. This is a song that would have been sung in preparation, maybe uh, heading to, towards the, uh, the temple, to tabernacle, to worship. And it just recounts the history. Moreover, he called for a famine upon the land. He broke the whole staff of bread. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for his servant. Now look at verse 18. Whose feet they hurt with fetters and was laid in iron. Until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. The king sent and loosed him, even the rule of the people, and let him go free. He made him lord of his house and rule of all of his substance. From the time that I'm little, when I've heard the stories of Joseph in the prison, we understand he, he found uh, favor with the keeper of the prison. And, and, and I guess in my mind, I just kind of figured it was kind of like... Uh, uh, the jail there on, uh, in, in Mayberry. They just kind of had the key hanging off to the side. You could just grab it and kind of let yourself out. And he kind of had, had his own free reign to go. Psalm 105 doesn't say that. Look back at that verse. Now, we, we know that he did find favor. I'm not, just, I'm not saying that. I want you to see this. He says in verse number 18, whose feet, whose feet? Joseph's feet. Whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron. Until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. What I'm saying is it took courage. And as, as Joseph was in Potiphar's prison, as he was in Pharaoh's prison there, 
and his feet are being tried in, in, in fetters, and he's being laid in iron. And he, no doubt he probably felt like he wanted to just give up. No doubt he probably think this has to be the end. Every, every turn he's taking, something more is, is happening worse. It just, it's not getting any better. But I have to believe it says until the, the time the word of the Lord came. He had a word from God. He had, he, had, he, had a, he had a dream that said, hey, listen, the, the, the sun and the moon and the stars, they're going uh, to uh, give obeisance to you. They're going to bow down before you. And every, every morning, Joseph could look in that prison. He could say, my, my siblings aren't here. God's still working. I'm not, I'm not giving up yet. I'm going to continue to go. And, and, and another day would go, and, and more heartache and more physical pain. But it does, again, God's word held him true. It, held, it allowed him to, to be courageous in that prison. And we understand the end of the story in Psalm chapter 50, verse number 20. Joseph says, but as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. If you and I are going to be the be thou there Christians, we're going to need to be people of faith and some people with some courage. In the face of adversity, in the face of, in light of uncertainty, we're going to need some courage. As we close out this year and we launch into a new year and beyond. Our final lesson tonight is in obedience. It's one thing to have faith, it's another thing to have courage, but it takes obedience to put into action. Look at uh, chapter 2, verse number 19. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he rose and took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. I have to believe this is more of a happy journey than it was going to Egypt. Can I just remind you, it's always good to get out of Egypt. Christian, it's always good to get out of Egypt. He's excited. He's, he's heading back. But look at, look at verse number 22. But when he heard that Archelaus had reigned in Judea in the room of his, uh, his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither. Notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. We're not, we're not given the, the, uh, the details of that dream, that warning. But we know that he responds. And the Bible says in verse number 23, he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. He, he obeyed by staying and he also obeyed by going. He was told to arise and take and he arise and took. Sometimes obedience really is that simple. Sometimes we overcomplicate it. We put too much thought into it. It's just simple. Just obey. Now, the Bible says here he was afraid to go thither. That just simply means that he was, he was fearful. He was alarmed. It can also mean an improper and an impediment uh, to faith and to love. And God in his mercy warns him. He, 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 God warned him. He, he, he admonished him. Joseph was obedient in, in heeding God's warning. He went a different way because he went a different way. Uh, once again, God's word is obeyed and prophecy is fulfilled. It's easy for us. We could, we could look at the circumstances that we're in and we can begin to wonder Lord, what are you doing? We see people we love, people we care about are hurting. We see uh, uh, people that are divided, two different uh, spectrums of, a, of, of an uh, agreement or disagreement. And, and we can begin to wonder, Lord, what, what is it that you're doing? If we're not careful, if we're not carefully searching for answers in God's word and good godly counsel, our wonder can easily turn into wandering really quick. Uh, hold your spot there. Go to Genesis 37. Genesis 37. This is, again, back in the life of Joseph. Verse number uh, 13. Our final lesson is on obedience. And how quickly and how easily we can get distracted and lose sight of what God has told us to do. In Genesis chapter number 37, and begin reading in verse number 13. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem. Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said unto them, Here am I. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, and see whether it be well with thy brethren and well with the flocks. And bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a certain man found him, and uh, behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, What seekest thou? He said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, 
where they feed their flocks. And the man said, They are departed hence. For I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. If we're not careful, our, our wondering, our questioning can easily turn to wandering. We find here an example in, in the life of Joseph. We, he, he's not in any sin. The, the Bible clearly does not, he's not doing anything wrong, so to speak, here. It just says he was wandering. We look up that word wandering. It means traveling without a settled course. Well, he was lost. He couldn't find his brothers. He really didn't know what to do. It also means deviating from duty. We, we find it, we're, we're so easily sidetracked in our lives. We can, we, if we're not careful, this, this political climate, this civil unrest, we can get so caught up in it, we forget what it is that God really has for us to do. We're looking at life, uh, lessons of, of faith and courage and obedience in the life of Joseph. And we look, in, e- even in our passage, even in our passage we see in, in, in verse number 16, uh, down through verse number 18, how that, how that Herod is, is killing, he's, he's slaughtering these children. And how horrible that must have been. No doubt that had to be a, a scary situation for everyone that had a young child. I have to believe there were, there, were, there were lots of families fleeing that area. And we can look at this and, and I'm reminded that, that uh, uh, man will get evil and more evil. Man will find more and more ways to try to subvert the plans of God. Man's pride will cause him to do more and more unspeakable things. That's why God has us here. This is all the more reason for you and I to, to be courageously faithful and obedient to the Lord. I'll remind you what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Amen. That means as a child of God, God has a plan for our life. So what is it that God's speaking to you? Where is your uh, be thou there command? What is it that God's bringing to your heart tonight? Well, very, very simply... We all have a responsibility to bring honor and glory to our Savior. In Matthew chapter 28, we find the Great Commission. Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. If we're not careful, we can, we can look at 2020 and we can kind of begin to feel sorry for ourselves. We could look at 2020 and we could think that, boy, it's never been this tough before. Ministry is different and life is different. Families are different. Everything is different. And, and if we're not careful, we can easily just, just kind of fold away and, 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 and miss sight of what God has to do. I believe some lessons from Joseph that God would have us to be more faithful and more courageous and more obedient in the coming days. I... Uh, just got a, a burden for our neighborhood. Normally, anytime we're doing any type of an event, we'll uh, uh, try to get you know six, seven houses on each side of our neighborhood. And uh, this year, just knowing you know that a lot of places are canceling all kinds of stuff, and we just thought, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do our neighborhood. It consists of about four streets that run east and west, and then two streets run north and south. Just a little little cubby hole in a little neighborhood over there. And uh, I said, well, I'm going to. So I, I went out on Tuesday. And, and basically did our street, just canvassing, putting the, uh, uh, the cantata flyers out there. And then on the following Wednesday, I'd planned on going out again. And I'd already made plans to go out Saturday with my dad to be in, there in Toledo to be in the woods with him and just spend some time with him. And, and uh, I knew it was going to be kind of cold on that day. Maybe they were calling for a chance of snow. Well, I, got, I left my office on Wednesday with every intention of completing my neighborhood. And uh, I walked out, and there's snow already started uh, on that Wednesday. And uh, I thought, well, I'm going. I mean, if I go, if I go sit in the woods with my dad in the snow, why wouldn't I do this for the Lord? And uh, I started to think pretty good of myself, boy, going out there and canvassing in the snow, and uh, you know, trying to just just go ahead and just do it, right? And uh, get all done. I, I, I told, I, I met with Brother John Blankenship, our outreach pastor. I said, listen, I go, here's the deal. I said, I'm going to get my neighborhood four times a year. We're going to canvas. Our family's going to take our neighborhood. And we're going to do, you know, the Easter cantata. We'll do John and Romans in the summer. We'll do the fall revival. And then we'll do the Christmas cantata. Every, every year, four times a year, we're going to canvas. And we're going to claim that neighborhood. And uh, we just so happened this past week, Pastor Pete was up in the kitchen, and we're just fellowshipping. Folks are talking about some stuff. But anyway, I, I counted, I counted that, uh, the houses in my neighborhood. And, 
it came out to 211 houses. And I thought, man, ooh, good guy, 211. Just canvassing, by the way. I wasn't door knocking, just canvassing. And uh, then I thought, you know, back in, in my sales days, we would always measure activity uh, based on things out of your control, making so many dials, so many calls. It, it was just a numbers game and the law of large numbers. And one of the things we would talk about is the difference between 211 and 212. It's, it's one number. Well, at 211, water is hot, but at 212, it begins to boil. And I remember that, that, that analogy that we use in sales all the time. I said, man, there's one more house we got to get. That way we can get our 212. And so we did. So we did. We got that house. We got that whole neighborhood all buttoned up. Well, about three or four days later, Pastor Pete's up in the office in the kitchen there talking about our founding pastor. And he was knocking, knocking, not, not canvassing, knocking on 400 doors a day when he started this church. All of a sudden, I had thought about my efforts of canvassing four, six streets. It just came to really, really small. I, I finish with this. I believe God has uh, a plan for each and every one of us in this room. Each and every one of us has a be thou there. There's a college student here. God's working in your heart. God's telling you to be thou there. There's a high school student, Heritage Christian School student. God's telling you to be thou there. There's a student in a public school, a Christian student in a public school, and God's telling you, be thou there. We need it. We need it. There's a bus driver for Cleveland Baptist Church, and God's telling you, be thou there. I know we only had one today, but it's one. It's worth it. I know you only had three on your bus today. Is it worth it getting up early and starting the cold bus and uh, fighting the snowy roads in Cleveland? You better believe it. It's worth it. It was a great day. It was a great day in my life when I learned I'm not responsible for people trusting Christ. I'm just responsible for sowing the seed. Amen. That's my job. I believe God would have us to be faithful, to be courageous, and to be obedient. How about you tonight? What is your be thou there? What is it that God's called you to do? Maybe there's a place of service. The pastor has spent uh, a few weeks here dealing with our spiritual gifts. And maybe you've, you've uh, you know, flirted with the idea of something and thought it'd be good, and, 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 but you haven't followed through on it. Maybe tonight would be a good night to make that public. Come down, you know, uh, pray with one of our altar workers. Make a public record. Hey, I'm, I'm going to talk to so-and-so about serving this ministry. Soon as, ne- here, we'll give you a break. You can say next year. I'm going to do it next year. It's next week, all right? But where, where's your be thou there? I believe God would have us to be faithful, be courageous, and be obedient.